Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Christine Crossley. I'm the Office of Homeless Solutions Director. Um, and I'd like to welcome you to episode one. It's our very first podcast. I know. Uh, a seat at the table. So this is uh, going to be a podcast where we talk about exchanges of ideas around homelessness, um, how you solve it, how you get your hands around it, how you mm -hmm. really acknowledge the humanity of people in this situation, while also finding a way out of it. Yeah. Um, so for today, I'm going to introduce you. Um, we're going to have a conversation with someone who has a unique connection to our unsheltered neighbors. Um, he has an experience being on both sides of homelessness and has experienced the scarcity and plight of being unsheltered, as well as overcoming it to be the director of his own nonprofit uh, named Karma Box. Uh, with that, I would like to introduce Grant Denton to episode one of Seat at the Table. Grant, do you want to say a little bit about yourself? I'm Grant Denton. I'm the founder <laughs> of the Karma Box Project uh -huh. um, out of Reno. And uh, yeah, and it's just a, it's, we're a nonprofit that started out as, um, it was a grassroots community effort. We just started putting up um, free pantries around the community. I was working at a methadone clinic and I got the clients bought in to giving back to the community. So we would bring, build these little library boxes, we would paint them, and then uh, we would stick them up in front of stores. And uh, the idea was that we take a box, we paint it, we put it in front of a store, and our act of giving back to the community would be every week, we would go fill it with stuff. And so people, whoever needed, would come and get stuff out of it. But Almost like a, like a food pantry with a clear door, you can get clear something door, out of it. Clear door, yeah, yeah. And, but what happened was, uh, it, the the community really embraced it. The community really wanted to, they wanted to start making their own boxes. They started reaching out. How do I make my own box? How do we this? How do we that? And at first, I think the idea is that you don't ask permission. You just do stuff. You make it cool enough for uh, for people to accept mm -hmm. it. And it just went like it, uh, it blew up really quick. Now we have, you know, over the course of four years, we went from one box to 70 Wow. Uh, karma boxes throughout uh, northern Nevada wow. and it's just and I, and that's I mean people want to do stuff people are good people want to help yeah. and it's a simple way to help or it's it's, it's a simple way to help um, a kind gesture and it and what it that really does is it's just with what problem you're solving is the little bit of hope problem you know and mm -hmm. you're you're planting mm -hmm. seeds of civic responsibility getting people bought into doing a little something and then you know, uh, so yeah. and I love that idea because I think, you know, those of us who during the pandemic helped with food lines and, and handing things out, homelessness and for those who are unstably housed, it doesn't look like what you assume it looks like. Right. I mean, it could be someone pulling up in a very nice car who still needs that that food or that little bit of hope. Oh, yeah. No, well, you, you have and most people uh, we perform well. So when we're not doing good, we won't show you we're not doing good. Mm -hmm. It's in a, you know, and so uh, you don't know who's who's struggling out there. So yeah, it it, uh, it yeah it gave a uh, gave a platform for people to give and the people who take when they yeah for, with dignity you know. yeah yep. How did you get over? I think all too often there's the idea, and it's been coined not in my backyard, but it's much more than that. This assumption that if you provide services people will come and it will make the neighborhood less desirable. You know, statistically, we know that's not true, um, but it doesn't, it doesn't negate that fear, I think. Well, I, well, there has to be an understanding that like, I think, look, up to the, look, they're here. We're here, right? Mm -hmm. And up to this point, uh, when it comes to homelessness, because homelessness in the beginning was more of a situational problem, right? The rent was raised, you lost your job, situation, you just need a place to stay for respite, rest, recovery, and then you're back into the world, and then reentry, right? And you're back into the world. But now we got different problems. Now we, in, a, in, a, in addition to the housing affordability problem, we got behavioral problems. Mm -hmm. Drugs have evolved. Mental illness has evolved. There's mm -hmm. not enough... Um, there's not enough providers and, and we're, we're, we're at a loss, right? So it's, it's, there's, it's a bigger problem than just homelessness is just a symptom of these things, yeah. right? And, yeah. and for, for most people in a community, it's an optics problem, right? It's something we don't want to see. And so we just kind of want to slide it over here, right? And so we don't have a problem anymore, mm -hmm. but it's still there. And if you can get people bought into the idea that, um, they're part of the body, you know, how you treat your vulnerable is a direct reflection on the type of community you are. Yeah, you know? the health of the community. Well, yeah. And so it's, it's important that we get people bought into this, right? And we also have to buy into the fact that it's going to take a lot of work. 
It's yeah. going to take a lot of work. You have to, you know, the idea in some people, the problem with homelessness is that you have, and, it, and every community has a cost. The cost that one homeless individual costs the community, right? Mm -hmm. um, a year. Some places it's 78,000, sometimes it's 88,000 because of services, emergency responses, emergency rooms, all the things. And, um, and the idea is that we don't just kind of shuffle these people off and make them other people's problems, is that we, we turn these folks who would have otherwise been financial liabilities in the community, because that's how folks are looking at it, and you, you use, you, and we turn them into assets in the community. And it mm -hmm. takes a lot of work. It does, the shuffling will just, they're still, they're still homeless. They're still gonna have issues. The idea is that we grow grow yeah. people. And, I, and I, that's what I'm saying. I think that's the, the NIMBY thing is a change of how people perceive it, how people see it. Yeah, that sense? it does. Well, yeah. and uh, speaking of, you know, good work and, and it, it takes, a, takes a, a larger movement, you didn't just stop with karma boxes. So you were talking about, you know, earlier how things build on top of other things as you build the infrastructure. So yeah. what came next? Well, you know, we started with the karma boxes and then uh, right in COVID, right? COVID was, I think everybody experienced what uh, it, 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 COVID really highlighted a, a bigger problem because what happened yeah. was when you have, you know, in a downtown area, you have a, you know, affluent downtown, people are there, things are moving, and then a downtown shuts down. Mm -hmm. And all you have left is your homeless population. Mm -hmm. Now you're paying attention. Now it's in what happened in Reno, just like what happened in other cities, is now we got a, a problem to solve. Now people are paying attention. It sucks that that has to happen, but. Now we're watching and we're like, well, what do we do with this? And and um, and so there was a shelter in place at the time. And in, and in Reno, folks were, were were camping under this bridge, and it you know blew up to to a camp it was about 350 folks, and it undulated. But um, and so there we turned. At that point, I quit uh, working in the business improvement district, and I started a nonprofit doing outreach. And uh, and outreach is is interesting. You know, because they they wanted you know they wanted Karma Box to do outreach in this this area. I wanted to do it, but you what you realize you're not going to go into a into a homes camp and be like, hey man, you guys ready to change your life? And somebody be like, yeah, let me just grab my stuff. Yeah, we can just not, head out. I'm ready. That's uh, not how that works. No, it doesn't work like that. You got to develop relationships and build rapport with people. And there's, I mean, we know if you, anybody working on the street to tell you it takes two to six months for someone to tell you the truth. Yeah, it takes a minute. Um, but at the for, same time, if you're just a person coming out of your job at the end of the day and someone comes up to you and says, I've got a million bucks, follow me. You're not going to go either. That's just not human nature. We're all skeptical of something that sounds like it's too good to be true. Yeah. And well, a lot of times on the streets, what we've done, because we as providers have to take responsibility for our role in this whole issue is that we've over promised and under delivered. Yes. We put people in situations that they weren't prepared for. We have a high recidivism rate because we're putting people in situations they're not ready for. We got to, we, well, it, and it, older models put people in housing with no services. Yeah. And so you just put someone into an apartment that's, you know, now it's quiet. There's no one around. It doesn't feel the same. And you expect them to survive. That's well, really you, intimidating. Well, yeah. We're trying to teach people how to ride bikes. You don't just throw them on a bike. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You got to run along inside the bike for yeah. a minute. So that's what. And so anyway, so went out there and we realized that in order to build rapport with someone, the best way to build a rapport with somebody is to solve a problem with them. And in a homeless camp, you got two main issues. You got environmental issues and behavioral issues. Mm -hmm. uh, the environment's the trash. Behavioral, we won't be able to work on that right now, but let's, let's work on the trash. And so I started cleaning up trash with them. And folks just started, they started helping me clean up trash. And it got to where on some days people would be like, hey Grant, man, I just cleaned up my camp. You know, and they would just be so pumped that they yeah. cleaned up their camp. And uh, I got the, the county, gave me a, a grant to be able to do a program called the River Stewards. Now, our, we have a river running through Reno called the Truckee River, and so um, we had a lot of homeless along that, along that camp, uh, along the river, and so we would just, we would grab folks up, I'd be, who, who wants to work today? And they would come work for four hours, we'd clean up the trash, um, and then after, I'd give them a gift card, and then I'd work on, work on getting them housed or into treatment or whatever their gig was, but that, that cleaning up gave us an opportunity to, to, uh, to get to know folks, build rapport, build trust more rapidly than you mm -hmm. would from coming out and, and visiting them. Um, How did that interact with the folks? Because, you know, you're, you're bringing people to come clean, but there are also folks living there. So how did... Uh, living on the camp? Yeah, yeah. Well, they saw that other people were doing it. 
Okay. People want to get involved. People want to be in cool stuff. It also worked for, well for the public. It was a stigma reduction model because the public is seeing, because there's, you know, homeless people, they thrash the place. Well, some people are messy, sure. But, uh, but once you see folks out there cleaning up and solving a problem, once you see the population, we all wear the same uniforms when we're on the street. Mm-hmm. So 10% of the population will make 90% of the noise. And so we have to, uh, so it's important that we get these folks out there solving some problems and showing the rest of the public that, uh, that they, you know, that they can do these things, you know? Yeah. 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 So, uh, so yeah. So we started that program and we beefed up our, our outreach program. We created one, uh, called the street keepers where we're, mm-hmm. where we're more in the camps. And then, uh, from that, we just, we, um, pitched the County on a safe camp. So we opened up a safe camp that evolved from tents along the strata of the street to uh, to a village of Mod Pods. Okay. Was there any other agency in the county or in the area working with you that already was moving people into housing or was that, you know, was there a, a longer runway to get people into housing that necessitated having a temporary spot? Uh, there was, at that time, there was multiple agencies, but, in, and I'm sure, every, like we're right now, the pendulum swinging, we're, starting to evolve in how we address homelessness. You'll see it other places. We're paying attention. We're shooting for a radical middle solution. Do you know, things yeah. are things are getting better. It's before five, 10 years ago, people were all, everybody's talking about silos, silos, silos. Now mm-hmm. we're doing, now we're coordinating together. Now we're working together. And that's, and you can see the, the benefits of that. That yeah. uh, So then there was, but it was, you know, spread out and it mm-hmm. wasn't as coordinated. Well, and I feel like during COVID, a lot of the working together uh, came about because there had always been a will Mm -hmm. to solve it, solve the issue, solve homelessness. But having one or two main massive funding sources come in from the government and say, hey, you all now have the means to collectively work together and point everyone in the same direction. You know, yeah. isn't isn't it amazing what you can do when you're all marching to the same tune? Oh no, it's awesome. The, and, and so we we put this money into it, and we're starting to pay attention. We're uh, we're getting better, and we were just talking about it earlier. We're getting better at um, outreach. Mm-hmm. We're de- developing relationships with our people on the streets. We're building trust. We're getting them into sheltering. We're getting them into transitional homes. Um, we're 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 getting. We're starting to get really good at this, and um, and we're going to get better. But the issue is, uh, is and I truly believe that it doesn't matter. Not that it doesn't matter, but we're that unless we figure out this affordable housing stuff, right? Yes. We can get really good at this, but we're just going to hang out down here. We're just treating the symptom. Yeah, we. Have, you know, you can work on. You know, we can address mental illness. Right. Once we address addiction, we can start to put things together and we'll understand the demand so that we can provide the supply. Mm-hmm. Right now, we don't really know. It's just, you know, so now we're starting to address and we're starting to dig in. But unless we figure out the affordable housing piece, um, we're just going to hang out down, down here, here for a little while. Yeah. You know, when you know, we we talked about at the beginning that you have experienced homelessness yourself. Yeah. And I think that brings a really unique perspective to outreach that a lot of people don't have. Um, what are some of the lessons that you brought in as you were creating this outreach team um, that maybe in, you know you, you hadn't seen done in other agencies who maybe have not had peer support networks of people who actually have experienced these issues? Well, I think it's, I think it's absolutely important. Uh, well, because, I mean, there's not the other, it's because you've been there. Right. And it went and it's of course, of course, you've been there. Right. That's what makes you appear. But it uh, it's I think it's necessary because that's that's part of the gig is you can look. I, I was on the streets. I was a homeless. I was homeless. I was addicted. And that makes me a subject matter expert at homelessness and addiction. Yeah. But just my homelessness and addiction. Mm. So just because I solved my problem doesn't mean I can solve his problem. But where the value is, is that I have buy-in for it. Because a pillar in most people that have climbed out of this, a pillar in their recovery is helping other people. We have a level of commitment to this that, mm-hmm. uh, do you know, that'll, that'll keep us in the game. Do you know? And I yeah. think that's our, one of our biggest issues is uh, folks staying in the game. 
Yeah, one, something that I, I'm very happy to see more of in the U.S. that you didn't uh, a couple of years ago is the peer recovery network and the yeah. importance of that, which is the simple idea that those who can help the most are people who have walked in someone who's on shelter's shoes yeah. and can say, I see you, not from a caseworker standpoint or a, you know, I've done all the research standpoint, but just the, hey, I get it. You need to figure out some things that maybe you don't want to ask your caseworker about, but you can ask me. Yeah. Because I understand this. And it seems like such a simple idea, but it took a long time in the U.S. for it to catch on. Yeah. And I, well, I think that's also like it's it's uh, training properly and utilizing mm -hmm. folks properly. And um, yeah, I just, yeah. I'm... Well, when you talk about utilizing folks properly, something that we talked about um, and I, I loved uh, you said um, toxic altruism mm. and overgiving. And I think we've experienced this here in Dallas and we have a, a Give Responsibly campaign that talks about giving 2.0. Um, mm -hmm. And I think, you know, we have a very strong uh, community in Dallas. On the one hand, very altruistic, wants to give and help. But then we also have the processes that get people into housing. And for the longest time, they were working side by side, but not together. Yeah. And so we're trying to bring everyone to the same t table to work harder, not smarter. And I really, some of the stuff that you had said um, in your TED talk yeah. and earlier about what happens when people don't plug into what's going on and just go out to give on their own really resonated with me. Well, you, so that's, I, look, there's five, or there's four responsible parties when it comes to solving this problem. Mm -hmm. There's the government, right? The leaders, the money comes from here. There's the agencies, right? That's yeah. us, we're the ones doing the work. But then there's the public and there's the homeless population. This whole time we've been trying to solve the problem with the, the government and agency or in agencies without getting the homeless involved um, and uh, and the public. The public has a role. You can cause a bigger problem than you can help for in many different ways. And it, and not like saying that you, we don't want folks to help, but we've been conditioned to help this way for so long. And yeah. you, you look uh, like when you know you'll. And you look at the difference, so you have, you have three different kinds of help, you have the spectrum of help, and then you have the three different ways that, that help impacts. Mm -hmm. So the, the three different types of help when we're in this, um, in this uh, situation is you can help somebody stabilize, which you can get them, well, in this, well, we'll just say you, you can, I'm sorry, you help somebody survive. Yes. Somebody's hungry, you feed them, they're cold, you give them a jacket. You can help somebody stabilize, uh, which is you get them into a house. Uh, and you can help somebody thrive, which is you teach them how to keep the house. Mm -hmm. We, up to this point, haven't been introduced and thrive. So what happens is people get stuff, lose it, get it, lose it. And after a period of getting something and losing something, get it, lose it, get it, lose it, it makes more success for an individual to be successfully homeless than it does to suck at being housed. Yeah. And we had a role in conditioning people to... Uh, to think that way and to feel that way. And what we do is we put this overarching cloak that takes hope away from people. Without trying, without trying, because if someone's like, they've been helping me for so long and I can't figure it out and I can't, so we're, we're contributing to people losing hope if we don't properly teach someone how to thrive. And that takes time and it takes yeah. a lot of effort. And it's like, you know, you walk into these, people are coming to our safe camp and be like, how long does it take to fix them? 90 days, six months, how long can we fix this person? Does it take to fix the person? I'm like, ah, it took a whole lifetime to get him here. Yeah. So I, I, don't, I don't know about that. I think we gotta take different approaches. And then you have the spectrum of help. And right in the middle in the spectrum of help is a, a kind gesture, right? Someone's hungry, you give them a granola bar. Cool, that was kind. But did you solve a problem? Nah, because you yeah. solved the right now problem, but in two well, hours. And how is that, you know, there, there's the transactional argument as well. I think I've heard some very powerful comments here from um, some of our resident uh, clergy who've said there's giving someone something that's transactional and makes you feel good. Yeah. And then there's asking them what they need and giving them their, back their humanity. Yeah. And, and rehumanizing the conversation. And, and, so, and there, so that's it too, though. So uh, yeah. remember what they need, because I want to I circle back to what they need. Okay. Um, uh, 
because that's as far as impact, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you got a kind gesture that's right down the middle, but we don't really solve the problem. We just, we solve it for now two years, two, two hours you later. You do something and you move on. Yeah, and then you go to the far side of the spectrum. That means solving the problem. Yeah. Solving the problem in under the the umbrella of, or in the context of, uh, of being hungry means setting someone up to where they'll never ask for food again. They'll never have to ask for food again. That's solving the problem. But that takes a lot of work. And that's takes, the stabilizing. That's when, you, when somebody's thriving right there, Thrive, when you set okay. them up. But when you move to the other side of the spectrum, it's you take kind gestures repeatedly over and over and over and over again until you cre create pathological altruism to where you're helping so much, you're making someone sick. Mm. Do you know? And what we look mm -hmm. at, like if you look at the camp, uh, we would find uh, people would never have to leave the camp because folks were bringing so many things to them, you know, yeah. that they never had to leave. And on the streets, everything's currency. Yeah. You could bring a fire truck out there and they're gonna keep it because they might be able to trade it later. It's just the economy of the streets. Like, so we, we know that everything's currency, so we bring things out, they'll take it. They might not even use it. But the point is, is that we're, what it is, it's a deflation of psychological drive. So you're, you're still in someone's drive to be able to go out and do stuff. Mm -hmm. And so that's, a, that's another conditioning that takes place if we help in the wrong direction. And so the impact is there's, when it comes to helping, and this is the help uh, asking folks, what do you need? Yeah, rehumanizing. It's good to do that, kind of. And okay. so what we found is there's, you got micro, meso, and macro okay. um, impacts when you help people. You help people on a micro level, that's just helping them. Mm -hmm. To do what? I was gotta ask helping someone to do what? Mm -hmm. And then how is your help in affecting the group and how does it affect the community? So you can, look, I was in a park one time and a guy was camped out in this park. It's a family park, right, it's for a minute. And he told me the first day, he was like, man, I'm just, I'm just having a picnic. I'm like, all right, cool. And I came back the next couple of days, he's like, just having a picnic. I'm like, bro, you're 48 hours past the picnic. <laughs> And, uh, yeah. and, you know, and, and, and there's this, the, and so I'm like, and I'm trying to be creative, talk, you know, to, to negotiate with him, to get off the, you know, to move to the next phase or to come to the shelter with me or to come to treatment with me or let me get him home. He was from New York. <clears throat> and, um, and I asked him, I'm like, hey, his, we actually called him New York because he's running. I'm like, hey, New York, man, how can I improve your situation? New York says, um... Give me $20. And he was right. I'd have been more ambitious. I'd have said 40. But, uh, but he was right to improve his situation. I'd have gave him 20, he, I could have just gave him $20, but it didn't solve a problem. He, what was he going to, yeah, it's the to do what? $20 to yeah, do what? And are we moving to the next phase? Or what do we, so that, that would have helped him, but wouldn't have helped the community. Do you know? Mm -hmm. And so, or the group. And so when, you, when we look at helping, we got to think about, are we helping people do what? And because uh, if you ask someone, what do you need? Well, need to do what? Need to get off the street or need to stay on the street? Mm -hmm. Or need, you know, and so we have to look at, and of course there's like, like I said, there's, there's harm reduction things. Someone's cold, you should give someone a jacket. Yeah, if you know? it's 100 degrees outside and someone looks like they're really thirsty, give them a bottle of water. Yeah. But that's not the same as dropping off a tub of coats at an overpass where you don't know anyone's sizes, you don't know if they need a coat, yeah. and then you turn around and get mad that there's litter on the underpass. Yeah. Like, I, who, I, who's responsible for that litter? Yeah, for sure. Well, it, look, can I tell you a story real sure. quick? So, um, we were, uh, we had a group come to the shelter, and they brought their kids with them, and they made sandwiches, and we set up a banquet table, because the family wanted to bring the kids to have this experience uh, mm -hmm. handing out sandwiches well one of the families it was a single mom she had a couple kids i'm sure uh you know these kids were little little like me right? a little <laughs> crazy and uh, uh -huh. and so we're uh when she was driving she's called me she's like i didn't have a chance to make sandwich i couldn't do it can i'm just gonna come and i got the kids she had the kids uh with index cards and crowns drawing uh notes saying you're beautiful somebody that and spelling them wrong right oh. you're beautiful you're beautiful Someone loves you, and they were religious. There was, you know, Christ cares, all the mm -hmm. things. And, uh, and they would hand, some people was handing sandwiches out, and they'd take the sandwich, they'd put it in their pocket, or they'd take the sandwich and they'd eat it. But everybody that got these notes would look at the note. They're like, oh, oh, that's cool. 
Well, that day ended about two weeks later. One of the guys we were trying to get into treatment, uh, get him into detox, finally leaned in. He said, man, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. So we carried him over to the, uh, to the detox, which is right around the corner. And I'm trying to get his ID out of his pockets. So I'm digging in his pockets. Can't find his ID, but in one of his pockets, I pulled out a roll of papers and this little note. Oh. Now, this is weeks later. I'm not saying that notes are going to change people's lives, but it will make a little bit of an impact that's important. And, I'm, and the reason I'm saying that is because the sandwich will be gone tomorrow. There's some things that you can say to folks. Like when I recovered, people were like, what was it? It was, ser- it was a series of things, but there's people touched my hand. Someone gave me a hug once when I wasn't someone that was huggable, Do you know? Yeah. And uh, so it's, it's little things. You have more of an impact if you really look at it when it comes to helping either helping to solve the problem or just loving on somebody. And I'm not saying go out and just hug everybody on the streets, but. But but. (laughs) A a good example of that is, you know, whenever I get calls from from people who are unsheltered or someone wants to talk to me, and this has been true for, for the many years I've been doing this, one of the first things that people most often say is, I'm sorry to bother you. Mm -hmm. And they apologize for their time, for taking up space. And I always say back, well, my job is to be here for you. My job doesn't exist except for to help you. And they kind of go, oh, you know, but I, I, it's heartbreaking that your first thought is to apologize for bothering someone. For just being there. Yeah, for just being there. Sorry. That's It's heartbreaking. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think that's, there's a huge quality of life to be gained in just acknowledging anyone else's, the other pe- person's humanity and that they matter just as much as you do. Oh yeah, for sure. And look, there's uh, people got, there's intrinsic value, you know, you don't, they, what was that? Who remembers the 80s when baby Jessica fell in a well? You remember? I remember the story. Baby falls in a well, the whole country shuts down. Everybody's mm-hmm. at the edge of their seat. What's happening with baby Jessica? They shut the city down. They got all kinds of things. Pulling this, trying to get to this baby. Days. And then they're sending her down food, all kinds of stuff. And then eventually they end up getting this baby, pulling the baby out. Everybody's happy. And the, the question is, like, why did a whole country shut down because of, a, because of a baby? The baby has no friends, has no money, right? Has, hasn't done nothing for nobody. Um, but the reason that everybody's concerned about this baby is because of what she could potentially be, right? She carries value without doing nothing, mm-hmm. right? And right now, on the streets, when it comes to the homeless, people that just walk right over a well. Do you know? Yeah. But if we if we look at it from a from a different perspective, right? The people don't have to do nothing to carry value. Yeah. Do you know? Yeah. Well, it's the same on a much larger scale as the tenants of housing. First, you don't have to do anything to deserve housing. Mm-hmm. You just are a person, and people need housing. I mean, if we can rescue animals and feel bad when they're outside, surely human beings are you know, carry the same weight or currency, we should all be inside. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, it's such, it's such a complicated topic. And I think when, when we talk to folks about this, it's very easy to throw up your hands and say, okay, well, nothing I, nothing I do is right. I'm just going to do what I know, which is making sandwiches and handing them out because everything else sounds too complicated. So what would you say to someone, you know, who, who maybe has, Grown up making sandwiches at church on a Wednesday night. I mean, that was me my entire childhood. To say, no, it's, it's not that scary. You can come work with us. There's a space for everyone. Um, I think that part of the gig is if we want homeless folks that are living on the streets or that are addicted uh, to, change, to change their situation, the individual has to change. Mm-hmm. So if you want to change a situation, like how many sandwiches does it take to get someone off the streets? Doesn't matter because it doesn't take sandwiches. I'm not being no, but no. It's, it's, like it, that's the sandwiches don't get people off the streets. Yeah. What get people? What gets people off the streets is uh, is accepting the services that are necessary for the, each individual. And so if if we're expecting people to change, then we have to be willing to change how we help. So if you want this person to change, then you might have to change how you help. And it, and it, so that and and what that looks like is just replacing it. It's not not doing it. It's just replacing how you how you help. So you Mm -hmm. use the same, you can use the same energy, you can use the same time, you can use the same effort, but actually have a 
produce more and help in a more effective way if you partner with agencies. Mm-hmm. If you actually reach out to agencies that are already doing it, you know, yeah. um, and I think and, and support those agencies, you know, I, yeah. I think that's the, the number one way to shift how you help and ask them. We, we need volunteers. Nonprofits need people. We need your help. So, yeah, ask what, what, it, what, it, what a nonprofit needs and be willing to do it. People want to help how they want to help. Yeah. Sometimes how you want to help isn't what we need. So, and you so know, it's reaching out and yeah, having ask, a conversation. Yeah, ask what's, yeah. what's needed. And then you move in that direction. Goodness. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I'm being told we need to wrap up. But um, yeah. it, it's absolutely fascinating um, to hear all of the amazing work that you're doing. And it is really refreshing to be hearing, you know, about all of this work that brings people together. And I love that because so much of what we talk about here in a seat at the table is not we do this professionally and you don't, so you shouldn't do it. You don't know what you're doing. It's realizing that everyone brings intrinsic value to the work Mm -hmm. and that at at the end of the day, it's just about shared humanity and value. Yeah. And there's always a way to plug that in. Um, and so I'll be excited to hear what you guys are doing next. Um, you know, it sounds like there's a, a lot of good work going on. Yeah. Um, but for now, uh, I just want to say thank you to everyone who's listening. Um, if you want more information on Grant and his story and efforts with Karma Box Project, you can visit www.karmaboxproject.org. And uh, this will, is on the YouTube page as well. I'm Christine Crosley, and thank you for having a seat at the table with us. <laughs>